My name is Steve Edmonds, and um, I'm the co-founder of uh, One Florida Foundation, along with uh, Nyla Pipes and Don Voss. And One Florida Foundation was born um, in January. Uh, and the reason why it was born in January was because um, the three of us had been working on water policy issues for um, about eight, nine months and banging our head against the wall trying to find a, a reasonable, legitimate 501c3 corporation to work with that would actually work on solving the problems. Um, <clears throat> so that's an entirely different story altogether. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm here today is because of the work that, that we were doing in Tallahassee and in and DC. And we were going from office to office, um, from senator to senator, from, from representative to representative, and telling them about the woefully uh, important water infrastructure problems that we're having in the state of Florida. And they all said, yes, yes, we're, we're aware of that. We know that there's problems going on in the state of Florida. And you've got some great ideas on, on how to fix that. And then we kept getting the same question over and over again. How are you going to pay for it? Because, you know, you're going to the government. <laughs> you would think that they have a whole bunch of money that they could do stuff with. I mean, we got a lot of taxes that go through. We have a 70-plus a billion dollar budget in the state of Florida. Um, but representative after representative, Democrat after Republican after Democrat after Republican, the same question to get us to shut up and get out of their office was, how are you going to pay for it? So we fast forward a little bit, and um, myself and my partner Don Voss are uh, in Tallahassee at a, uh, at a conference, and we run across a gentleman that's running for attorney general. And he says, you know what, I think that, uh, I think that uh, um, your idea is a great idea. Um, if you all haven't figured out, the, the way that we're going to pay for it is hemp for water. Um, <clears throat> he said, you know, I think it's a great idea, and I think it would add, add to my platform, and, and I want to include it. Uh, would you be interested in, in letting a, a statewide candidate um, help you promote this idea? We said, sure. We hadn't had much pro progress in getting the word out or, or getting the name out. So, so we said, okay, this is, uh, this is something we can do. Is this going to work? There we go. So <clears throat> we started rolling out Hemp for Water. And Hemp for Water is designed specifically to answer that question that we keep hearing so often. How are you going to pay for it? Well, we have a new industry coming into the state of Florida. And a lot of you folks here are focused or keened in on the medical part, or you might even be looking down the road to recreation. But where the money is at for all you entrepreneurs that are out there looking for a way to, to use cannabis as a business um, catalyst, you need to be thinking about volume. You need to be thinking about diversification of product. You need to be thinking about what has naturally been one of the most productive and beneficial crops in our country's history. And that's hemp. That's industrial hemp. The neat thing about hemp or industrial hemp is that it has less than 0.3% THC, which means that you could literally Whoops, I'm going backwards, sorry. Which means that you could literally smoke the entire field and not get high. You get sick from smoke inhalation before you would get high. And there is absolutely no reason, there's no reason why this substance should be on the controlled substance list in the first place. Now, I was originally supposed to go after Bill, and we got a little bit confused because people had to fly out and everything else and he left it hanging perfectly for me to pick up when he when he uh, finished up with his speech and that was talking about the Florida statute that um, allows the Attorney General to take things on and off the uh, controlled substance list so the first part of hemp for water relies on the fact that Bill's going to do that day one in office so what I'm going to talk about now is basically why we need hemp for water and what's going on with the state of Florida, if you weren't aware. The state of Florida is a very unique state in the fact that it is a, um, a peninsula. It's surrounded by water three ways. We have one of the only rivers in the world that runs opposite of the equator. We have our entire landscape um, crisscrossed by different waterways and different water resources. 
we have uh, all sorts of interesting interconnected ecosystems that work together with the supply of water. But what is constant about Florida is the, is the fact that it is so unpredictable. One year we will be in a, in a deep, deep drought in which the, there's no water anywhere and we have to figure out how we're gonna irrigate our fields. We have to figure out how we're gonna irrigate our oysters. We have to figure out how we're gonna keep salt water from intruding. We have to keep people in the cities with drinking water. The very next year we could be in a deluge which means that we've got the, the, the rainiest season that we've seen in years, and we don't know where to put all the water. We've got so much water that's coming in and throughout the state that it's making Lake Okeechobee reach flood levels. Then the Army Corps of Engineers steps in and says, hey, we've got to get rid of this water because there's a percent chance that this, that this dike that we built back in the 30s is going to breach. So in order to do that, we're going to flush outside, out, out the tide out of either side one out of the west side in the Caloosahatchee, out of the east side in the St. Lucie River and the Indian River Lagoon, we're going to flush 7 billion gallons a day on average. Now, I got into this whole thing prior to meeting Bill and when I was running around Tallahassee, um, and I was at the subcommittee on agriculture uh, and, and testifying as a, as a public respondent. And their biggest concern in that meeting was the fact that agriculture was in about a 15 billion gallon a day um, loss. They needed 15 billion gallons a day to survive or keep their production up. And I guess it didn't occur to anybody else, but I certainly pointed out to them that we were flushing 14 billion gallons a day currently out of each side of the, out of the state. And that's just out of those two rivers. We flush a lot more out of other parts of the state as well. So my question to them was, why are we not managing this resource? This is water. This is one of the most important things that requires all of our economy and all of our infrastructure and all of our human lives to survive on. Why are we, why are we worried about having to come up with programs and, and, and uh, fixes for agriculture and at the same time having to figure out how we're not going to flush all this water through estuaries and ruining a $3.7 billion economy in the marine economy on the coasts. And that's just one side, that's not the other side. So why are we doing this? Well, the answer was not available. Nobody had the answer. Uh, nobody has the answer still. A lot of people say, well, we've got to wait on the federal government to get involved to help fix this problem and, and finish fixing the Everglades. Everglades restoration started in 1954. How, how, how close are we to restoring the Everglades? Does anybody have an idea? Anybody out there? We've gotten nowhere. In fact, we've lost ground. And it, and it fluctuates every, every 10, 15 years. Somebody points their fingers at somebody else and says, it's their fault for not getting their funding at, together. No, it's their fault for not getting their funding together. Right now, we're waiting on something called SERP and SEP, which we've been working on since the 70s, by the way. And if that comes into play, we're going to get some money from the federal government. We're going to get a bunch of money, billions of dollars. And we're going to fix a little part of the Everglades. And that's going to be in total of our water infrastructure problems and needs, maybe 10, 15 percent. So <clears throat> we looked at everything that's going on, and we said, you know, if we could fix everything today, from Apalachicola, where we're suing the state of Georgia, over water coming down from Lake Lanier and through Georgia for fresh water to irrigate our oysters. Where in Central Florida, we are experiencing more than we've ever experienced in the past sinkholes on a regular basis because our aquifer has depleted. In Central Florida, where we don't have any drinking water because our aquifer has depleted. No secondary sources because our aquifer has depleted. In Jacksonville, Miami, Tampa, dealing with saltwater intrusion on a yearly basis to the tune of almost a billion dollars per city. The problem with Lake Okeechobee, which by the way is exasperated by Central Florida because we don't retain our wastewater, our stormwater runoff. We shunt it all down to the Kissimmee and the Kissimmee acts as a big arterial collector and that gets dumped into Lake Okeechobee and then, then the Army Corps of Engineers takes over because now it's flood control and conveyance. And now we're back to flushing water out the tide and, and wasting 
our state resources at the mandate and at the authority of the federal government. So <clears throat> being libertarian, we don't like the federal government all that much. So um, we, we, uh, we came up with a way to answer the question of how you're going to pay for it and get our state sovereignty back. So if we did it today, if we fix the problem in Apalachicola, if we fix the problems in the springs, if we fix the problems in uh, aquifer depletion in central Florida, if we fix the uh, water storage and water treatment problems from the transfer from central Florida down to Lake Okeechobee, if we prevent all of this pollution from going down and killing our reefs in Biscayne Bay and in the Keys, and we were able to do it to tomorrow, all at once, with today's dollars, estimates range between 30 and $50 billion. That's a lot of money. It would have been a quarter of that had we done this 20 years ago. All right? And if we wait another 20 years, it'll be four times that amount, if we're lucky. So in addition to that, we said, well, it's really kind of silly how all this water is being mismanaged and wasted and everything else. Wouldn't it be really great if we could collect it, clean it, and transport it to wherever we need to do? That's basically a pipeline and pump system and a couple reservoirs. And the estimates for that range anywhere between a billion and 10 billion. So we said $60 billion. $60 billion if you're going to fix it tomorrow. That's, that's our goal. That's our nut. That's what we're going to start this discussion out at is $60 billion. How do you come up with $60 billion? Well, <clears throat> my partner in, uh, in, in One Florida, he, he likes to put it a, a kind of a funny way. He looked at everybody and said, we're going to pay with it for pot. We're going to do it with pot. Of course, nobody here likes that. It's kind of politically incorrect or anything else. But the reality is, is most of the most of the population doesn't understand what's going on with the industry at all. Most of the population is thinking that, you know, oh, Charlotte's Web, we've got a medical bill. Most of the population is maybe wanting it for personal reasons, but they're not understanding the ramifications or the or the realities of the economics. The reality is, is that nobody's touched this e economy. What we could literally do is have a, an economy that generates revenue for needed public services. And we can start with water. So if you, uh, if you were to uh, go ahead and, and, and decriminalize or take it off uh, of, of the schedule tomorrow, you're looking at, a, at an industry that opens up overnight. You're looking at what we estimate to be I'm off on my, on my uh, slideshow altogether, I apologize. But we estimate to be in excess of nine and a half billion dollars, pretty much overnight. Overnight, you're gonna have several different industries that are gonna say, hey, great, we can produce industrial hemp. They range from textile industry. To give you an example, um, Georgia Cotton last year did one billion dollars on, on about 500,000 acres. So if you did about 500,000 acres of hemp, you could do about $2.5 billion worth of economy uh, just on the two and a half conversion schedule, which means that one acre of, of, of cotton, or one acre can produce this amount of cotton, it can produce two and a half times that amount of hemp. So in the state of Florida, we have 9.2 million acres of farmland that is in production. And I'm trying to find that slide there. And I may have to go back. This is, this is sort of where I was talking about. We have 9.2 million acres of uh, production right now. We estimate that if we were to uh, allow industrial hemp to be uh, farmed, that many of those farmers, including a lot of the citrus growers that are right now freaking out because their, their groves are, are dead, they're full of uh, canker and greeny, and they're about to lose their agricultural exemptions. We have all of these people that may find this a very lucrative and, and attractive opportunity. So we think that for the purposes of discussion, that two million acres going into hemp production is a pretty reasonable assumption. Not to mention that in addition to the 9.2 million that we have in production, there are several ranchers and farmland that have what, what, what amounts to non-productive land. It's land that's ready to go. It's not quite uh, uh, classified as natural lands. It's under, it's under private ownership. It's just not being utilized. And we have millions of acres on top of the 9.2 that are ready to go into production should 
people decide that that's in their, ad, their best advantage to do so. So everything that Hemp for Water is based on is, is, is 2 million acres. And this list that you see here is just some of the different industries that could come in to play. What we did was take the top two and the, top, and the, and the bottom two in terms of potential production. And we said, well, this is, these are the kinds of numbers that we can expect it to produce. You can see at the bottom of the slide, just out of, just out of the farming activities for those different uses of hemp, because it depends on what your final product or what you're growing it for, or how you're going to grow it, and what strands you're going to grow. Uh, there's, there's a lot of industrial strands, just like there are medical strands. Some give you more fiber, some give you better seed output, some give you a better flower output. And if you're going to be growing textiles, you're going to be growing something different for that than you are for health supplements for seed or for fiber, for paper, and for uh, wood um, replacement kinds of products. So when you open up the markets, you create all of these jobs and, and you create um, a, 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 an, a situation where there's an economy that has not been touched previously. And what I mean by that is in every other collection in the state of Florida, it all goes to what I call the general slush fund, right? Taxes are collected. Everybody in Tallahassee gets together and gets their pet projects together, and they say, I want this piece of the pie. And they all argue about how much money they're going to get for their pet projects and everything else. So instead of it going through that process at all, we want to take and exempt the businesses that are involved with industrial hemp from traditional business taxes, and we want to replace it with an excise tax called hemp for water. And that reallocation of funds, or earmarking those funds, if you will, for water infrastructure improvements avoids having to go through the legislative fight, and it creates a dedicated funding source for all of the different water infrastructure improvements that we have to provide for. So <clears throat> once you do that, you can complete the projects, and then once you do that, you can go on to the next problem. So what we're doing is we're reversing the cycle. We are in a negative cycle here, folks, where we, where we continually go down the toilet bowl and flushing the wrong way. We literally have to reverse that cycle and pull ourselves out of the sewer, and we have to make ourselves a, pro a productive economy again. And we can do that through agriculture and through industry and through opportunity, and hemp for water can do that. So <clears throat> the areas of concern we kind of went over, Apalachicola, the Springs, St. John's River, that's the river that runs opposite of the equator. There's only other, one other river in the, in, in the world that does that. Anybody know that? Denial. And we're all in denial. The Nile River. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> you have the Indian River Lagoon and Lake Okeechobee Basin, the Everglades, and reef habitat and restoration. These are just the tops. What we propose is to work on all water infrastructure. Okay. Um, so once you exempt the traditional tax and you and you decide what is the hemp for water going to look like? What, what is that excess uh, excise tax going to look like? Well, you have a couple different options. You can go at 5.5%, which is the corporate tax rate, or you can put in whatever percent you, you choose, or actually this is where we have to involve the legislature. I wish I didn't have to do it, but we have to. This is the second part of the plan in deciding how to and how much to make that excise tax. If you did it at 5.5%, it would take you 113 years to reach that $60 billion. That's a long time. Well, remember, it took us 88 years to get to this point now where we are in dire straits with our water. We're going to run out, guys, in 19, or excuse me, 2030, 2035. We're going to be out of fresh water. No more. We'll be importing all of our water uh, on a peninsula that's surrounded by water. That's pretty disgusting. But... It's true. If you bump that up to 75 to 8%, you're fluctuating between 78 and 89, 89 uh, years. And if you pick 15%, it'll take you 42 years to come up with that $60 billion. So <clears throat> that's a lot. But it's, it's kind of slow. I'm going backwards again. Why am I going backwards again? Sorry. You want to do it a little faster? Well, you can add what may be Amendment 2 or medical marijuana. Now, this may not happen. It could, it could be a little bit different. 
But we took, uh, we took a, um, the numbers from Colorado, and we said, well, it's 2.9% tax on, on medical in Colorado. And we think that our industry is going to be at least four times that. So again, we're working on conservative numbers. It's probably going to be a lot larger than that. But um, if you, if you in include those numbers, now, now your years to 60 billion drop to 180, <clears throat> 78, and 40. Want to go a little faster? You add Amendment 1. Now, this is something that, doesn't, that a lot of libertarians don't like to talk about because some of us are uh, in disagreement about it. But this is for discussion. This is what could be. This is what is possible. Also, Amendment 1 requires the legislature to decide how much goes to land and how much goes to water. I'm sorry, Amendment 1 is the water and land legacy amendment that is on the ballot for November, and it basically says that 33% of the dock, dock stamp taxes will go to land conservation and water conservation efforts. It's a constitutional that is being put forward. It does not look like it's going to pass, so this is for the purposes of discussion. If it was possible to say that 100% of those dock stamps revenues went to water infrastructure, which again is not likely. But we're talking in ifs here. If you were to do that, well, you guys have already seen the numbers. Less than 20 years. Less than 20 years to come up with $60 billion. That's pretty quick, and it also solves a pretty big societal ill. And more importantly, it does it without touching any existing revenue or any existing basket. You're not going to run into, oh, that's going to take away from my pet project or I need that money for something else. This is money that hasn't been touched yet. This is money that hasn't been created yet. If we're going to create this industry, let's make sure that we allocate the, the revenues from it to something that is going to help society above and beyond you know, the, the benefits of, of bringing this industry in in the first place. So again, we reverse that negative cycle. Because once we get done <clears throat> with the last step, we're picking the next one. What's it going to be? Is it going to be helping out our veterans? We've got a lot of veterans in the state of Florida that need some help. What about our seniors? What about we screwed up education with the lottery? Maybe we can go back and fix it with him. Because it is possible, folks. We can do just about anything we want with allocating the resources the way that we want to allocate our resources. This plan takes two, this plan takes two things. Okay, number one, we have to elect Bill Walsifer because there's no other attorney general candidate that has said that they will take industrial hemp off the schedule. They won't do it. In fact, Bondi has said that she will not under any circumstance. So no other, no other candidate has pledged to do so. Bill will do it. The second part is, is it takes your involvement. It takes, it, it takes you being a citizen and not just any citizen, but an active citizen somebody that is going to talk to their legislatures and talk to their representatives and say, you know what, I don't want that money going to the general slush fund. I want that money fixing my water. And then once I fix my water, I want it fixing something else. Because you guys tend to waste our money. You guys have a choice. You can run your government or it will run you. The question was, what are the realities of growing hemp? What do you, what do you need to grow hemp? Um, first thing you need is land. Uh, and as far as a, a number of acres, that really depends on what you're grow growing the raw product for, right? Um, to give you an idea, uh, in order to reach the, the, the textile, I'll use the textile example again, uh, numbers that Georgia put out for cotton, okay, you're looking at about a half a million acres uh, to do that. All right, that's, that's 500,000 acres. That's a lot to, to reach a full state production of textile. But if you wanted to, say, grow uh, seed for healthcare supplements, you know, and you had, a, you had a specific type of seed with a specific type of grow, you could do that on a few acres, on a smaller farm, you know, something that was, that was 10, 20, 100 acres. You're, it, re it really depends on what the final product that you're growing for is, is is going to determine that. The next part of this statement is the more important part of the statement, I think, in that regardless of what you're growing for, hemp generally yields somewhere between $600 and $1,200 an acre profit. 
All right. Now, to give you an idea of where that's at, sugar in the state of Florida is the leading, leading agricultural product, and that averages out at about $730 an acre profit. Okay. Behind that used to be citrus, and citrus is dying off rapidly. Our citrus industry is all but dead. And that averaged out at about $600 an acre. Your specialty fruits like blueberries, that's between three to 500, depending on how specialty they are. Same with your grapes. Somebody mentioned wine earlier. That's about the same range. Watermelons are about two, two to 300. Strawberries are about two to 300. All your vegetables are about two, two, 200 an acre is, is, is on average what they're getting. So hemp is a very lucrative crop in that term, but what's really even more neat about uh, hemp is the fact that you can have multiple grows uh, during one year. So you could be doing that kind of profit two, three, and in some cases four times a year. The other great thing about hemp is that it's a cover crop, which means that it takes all the bad stuff out of the soil and puts all the good stuff back in. So instead of our strawberry farmers and our blueberry farmers rotating with a crop like clover or flax or some other kind of cover crop that doesn't generate any revenue for them, they can now cover with hemp and make two to three times the amount of their regular crop. So in terms of economy, in terms of wealth generated, you're taking, you're taking a, an agricultural community that is struggling to survive right now, that is dealing with uh, widespread disease, and you're giving them an opportunity to turn things around literally overnight. And not only are you giving them an opportunity to replace some of their dying crops, but you're giving them an opportunity to make multiple per acre profits per year, which is really where the economy's at. Not unless the latest uh, uh, federal, not unless the latest federal move to decriminalize industrial hemp happens, which by the way, uh, was announced either yesterday or this morning. Um, there is a possibility that's, that is being circulated in Washington as we speak. If that does not occur, as soon as you transport, you are violating federal law. As soon as you go past uh, uh, state, state lines. So this would be something that would be and until federal laws change or until there is some sort of law that allows for transport and, and import and export between the states, um, this would be something that would only be able to remain in the state of Florida. Now, that being said, the state of Florida is one of the larger importers of hemp, not only in just the U.S., but in, in the entire world. We import an incredible amount of raw product so that we can manufacture. We have a company here in the state of Florida that is manufacturing airplanes out of hemp. Pretty neat. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, a few people that are interested in building with hemp. Um, last, last week we were uh, in Tarpon Springs at a house that was made um, almost entirely out of hempcrete. There are literally tens of thousands of different uses for hemp and its byproducts from nutritional supplements of eating the seeds and, 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 and providing uh, um, those types of things, obviously, to, and, and I'm trying to stay away from the medicine because the medicine is a different, is a different beast altogether. Um, but from nutritional supplements to topical supplements to beauty, beauty products, um, obviously textiles, clothing, uh, those types of, of uh, anything that needs a canvas. Canvas, by the way, uh, was originally made of hemp and that's there's, there's a name lineage that goes back to that. Um, building materials, strength materials, car materials, just pretty much anything that you can think of. Uh, it makes an incredible biofuel. The problem right now with making biofuel out of it is, is that hemp oil in its raw form is about 7 to $8 a gallon. And then you have to process it into biodiesel, which adds about another dollar a gallon to it. And now you're looking at $9 a gallon biodiesel. That's not... That's not too efficient or economical. But if we were producing millions of acres, then we'd have a lot. And economies of scale would bring those prices down. And it might get to a point where you can get a, a, a gallon of, of hemp oil at 2 to $3 ga a gallon. When, when that happens, now, now it only costs 3 to $4 a gallon to make biodiesel. And guess what? You've just, you've just beat the fossil fuel industry which is really, you know, 
one of the main culprits why this is all, all not allowed. Marijuana, in terms of medicine or, or recreational, isn't outlawed because the government cares what we're doing or cares what we do to our bodies or any of that sort of stuff. It's, it's outlawed because in the early 30s, the powers to be realized that the natural product was going to kick its butt all over the place. And they used their wealth and their political influence and their advantage, and they very effectively put together a campaign strategy and implemented law that would protect them. And it's protected them for almost 100 years. And it's run the country and the economy for their advantage. And I'll say it again. You can run your government or it will run you. So you guys can, you guys can uh, let the big corporations continue to control the legal environment and the political environment and tell you that you have to vote for an RRD and, and tell you that you have to hate the other guy because they voted for an RRD and keep you div divided and, and, and keep you um, displaced. Or you can take the reins and, and you can decide that you're going to control your own future. And you can elect people that are going to allow you to control your own future. And if you want to make some real money with cannabis, you vote for Bill Walsifer. He, he takes it off the schedule. And guess what? When, when do you take office, Bill, if you're elected? January what? January 5th. That means that January 6th, you can be planning industrial hemp. And you can be making money in this industry right away.